If you're a person who likes adventure and loves running into the unexpected, then join us and become the surprise traveler. See beautiful landscapes, wildlife revealing their secrets, fascinating architecture, We know you, as our fellow travelers, will cherish the journey. Amazing people and cultures that we cannot resist. Stories that captivate us. And share a laugh with us at the funny happenstances we stumble upon. Wonderful, spellbinding surprises await us as we take adventures around the globe. Every continent and country has its own treasures to be explored. Hello. Welcome to The Surprise Traveler. My name is Doug Chrisman, and I'm your host for this episode. In our last episode, part two of our exploration of Great Britain, we discussed the Queen's Palaces, British TV, and the King's Theater. In this part three episode, we're going to explore other areas in Southern England, including London, to share more British culture. But first, let's get ourselves oriented again as to what part of Great Britain we explore in this episode. Great Britain is part of the United Kingdom, which includes England, Wales, Scotland, and Northern Ireland. As we explore England, we find it's the center of commerce and political governance for all of the United Kingdom. The influence and the power of England since the medieval times and before has always shaped the destiny of many nations across Europe, the Americas, and part of Asia, an influence that is still felt across the globe today. In our visit to England, we explore some of these influences and get surprised along the way. Let's start by learning some fun facts about the country of England itself. Did you know famous scientist Isaac Newton, lauded as one of the most brilliant scientists of all time and most recognized for his discovery of gravity and its square law, Michael Faraday, who discovered the theory of electromagnetic induction, Charles Darwin, who shocked the world with his theory on the evolution of man, Stephen Hawking, who discovered that black holes emit radiation, and Tim Berners-Lee, who is credited with inventing the World Wide Web, are all British. Did you know London has the largest library in the world? The British Library in King's Cross has over 170 million items in its catalog. Did you know royal weddings can be public holidays? The English love their royals and certainly make the most out of a royal wedding. The most recent wedding being designated a bank holiday for the UK was when Prince William married Kate Middleton. The day of their wedding, April 29, 2011, was declared a bank holiday, which meant an extra day off work. Unlike Scotland, where we traveled a good portion of the country, in England we narrow our travels to just the southern region of the country. Within this southern region of England, there are plenty of unexpected surprises to uncover as we venture into five separate areas. We start our exploration in the London area. London is an exciting, vibrant city with a combination of royal palaces and other historic landmarks. This includes stunning examples of medieval and Victorian buildings, side-by-side -side new avant-garde skyscrapers and famous memorials. As well as checking out the must-see landmarks in the city, we take a day trip to southeastern England to visit the White Cliffs of Dover and the Church of England's ancient, still-functioning Cathedral in Canterbury that dates back to 597 AD. We also take a couple of other trips close to London, including the beautiful Leeds Castle and Berkshire Country, which is home to many British TV and movie sets. In part one, I showed you our visit to Windsor Castle. Also in our previous episode, we showed you the southwest coastal area of Cornwall. In Cornwall County, we visit Port Isaac, or by now, do you remember it, it is Port Wynn? the home of Doc Martin. 
After a thoroughly wonderful time in Port Isaac, we move on to the Somerset area where we will discuss the city of Bath to see how the Romans lived centuries ago. Over the next several days, we continue our drive through the Cotswolds toward Bletchley Park, stopping along the way and eventually arriving in Oxford before returning back to London. To get a full English cultural experience, we begin our trip in the London metropolitan area. London is the capital of England and its largest city with over 8 million people. London is rich in history with plenty of recognizable landmarks such as 10 Downing Street, the home of the Prime Minister. Not far from there are the Houses of British Parliament and Buckingham Palace, the primary residence of Queen Elizabeth II that we visited in our last episode. The city has iconic architecture, outstanding arts and theater, and is full of pomp and circumstance as well as grunge. London has a strong influence on Western power and politics. Renowned designers continue to set fashion trends. Filmmakers produce cinematic blockbusters that catch the world's attention. Parliament's political decisions reverberate across the oceans. In one word, London is impressive. We are staying in a small residential hotel in the Bayswater area. This location is very close to Hyde Park, allowing us easy access to walk to the destination sites within London we want to see. Within the park, we walk to Kensington Palace, Prince Albert's Memorial, and other sites. We find walking gives us a more intimate experience of the city and the people within it. This turns out to be a good choice here in London. It truly makes our adventure a more personal one. We are also close to an entrance into the underground. This gives us access to additional locations that are too far to walk, like St. Paul's Cathedral, shown here on the map on the right-hand side. From our first adventure out on foot, as we stroll amongst the Londoners in beautiful Hyde Park, we immediately feel the familiarity of British culture. The park is situated so that depending on the direction we walk, we can exit towards different locations we want to see throughout the city. At one of these exits, not far from Kensington Palace, is a memorial Queen Victoria had built for her husband Prince Albert after his death. At another exit, our walk leads us out a gate by the Wellington Arch, with only a short walk to Buckingham Palace, then to Westminster Abbey, the famous Anglican royal peculiar where coronations, weddings, and funerals have been held for many distinguished people, including the funeral services for Princess Diana on September 6, 1997. Do you know what a peculiar is? You might think it is another name for a church or a cathedral, but it is neither. It is a unique entity within the Church of England under the jurisdiction of a dean and chapter, which is subject only to the monarch and not to any archbishop or bishop. There are attractions within the park itself. One of the more interesting sites is Kensington Palace. Another part of British culture is British government and you can't speak to that very well without visiting the Palace of Westminster on the Thames River. We take a tour inside both the House of Commons and the House of Lords and learn how the United Kingdom's governing process evolved from a monarchy to its current form. Did you know the United Kingdom is a constitutional monarchy? There is a unitarian state for the United Kingdom that delegates its authority through a governing framework of a parliamentary democracy. Translated, this means that Northern Ireland, Wales, and Scotland all have their own individual parliaments but pass along other powers to the representatives in British Parliament. Under this form of government, the current monarch, currently Queen Elizabeth II, is the United Kingdom's head of state, and the Prime Minister, currently Boris Johnson, is the head of government. On the lighter side, as we move around the city, we take a very touristy ride on the eye a giant ferris wheel. It is actually worthwhile since it gives us a bird's eye view of downtown London. We see a sharp contrast represented between the beautiful old buildings like the Houses of Parliament and new building architecture like the Shard, creating an exhilarating charm to the city. If we're going to experience British culture, we wanted to have high tea. We enjoy a lovely high tea on our visit to Parliament and the next day we have a wonderful high tea at the Savoy Hotel. 
Let's take a moment to share the joy of this wonderful relaxing tradition. With some time on our hands, we walk a few blocks from the Savoy and explore Covent Gardens, a famous London market that is delightful to explore. We only scratch the surface of the market before we go back to the Savoy Theatre to catch the curtain call for a live performance of a popular play. Here is a surprise. Theatre goers pack into multiple bars within the theatre before the show starts. Then they take meals and drinks to their seats while the show is playing. We've never seen people eat meals and take their drinks into a theater for a live performance. I guess hats off to the British theater crowd for their ingenuity in making it a party. However, I've read that there's a lot of controversy over this practice and demands to ban it. We also go to several museums, and one of our favorites is the V&A, Victoria and Albert Museum, a short walk from the Prince Albert Memorial in Hyde Park. The building itself is noteworthy, especially the lobby, once you enter into the museum. We see the contrast of a massive modern glass sculpture by Dale Chihuly hanging from the dome not far from a medieval period church iron and brass gate in a hallway high above us. Other items throughout the museum are different jewelry collections and multiple famous sculptures, including the Age of Bronze and the Fallen Angel by Augusta Rodin. However, the area that caught my interest the most is the cast court, where we find casts of unique structures that were built from different parts of the world. This is a massive room where I'm dwarfed by the size of the exhibits. There are also some beautiful religious artifacts here, and others scattered throughout the museum that caught my eye. But there is another museum to share so it's time to leave, but not without a promise to come back again in the future. We are off to see the Tower of London, located on the Thames River adjacent to the Tower Bridge. Of course, one of the highlights at the museum is located in the Waterloo Block, a former barracks and jewels house, where royal guardsmen stand at the ready protecting the crown jewels. We can't take photographs of the extensive exhibit, but I can share a picture from public domain of just one of the displays. King Edward II's crown that is used in the coronation to crown a new British monarch, the scepter, which represents a ruling monarch's sovereignty, the orb, representing his or her Christian authority, and the royal ring. All are items used symbolically by ruling monarchs as part of their regalia in certain ceremonies, including during British coronations. This next photo is of the imperial crown representing the sovereignty of the monarch worn by Queen Elizabeth II after her coronation. She also wears it during the state openings of British Parliament. Less talked about, but quite interesting to see within the complex, is a building right on the Thames River where the king's quarters were located. We see his bedroom and go down a hallway to the chapel. Another nice treat we get from inside the complex walls is a beautiful view of the Tower Bridge arching over the Thames. The striking architecture of the Shard. And other London landmarks nearby. But before we leave London, let's look at one last museum that I insisted on visiting, Warner Brothers Studio. Come join me for 90 seconds and experience a taste of the wonderfully magical world of Harry Potter as I fly along with the cast into adventure. Meet Harry, Hermione, Ron, and their protectors, as well as Lord Voldemort, and his wicked and evil pack of dangerous characters and creatures. You're entering into a world 
a fascinating make-believe, but be careful, the Gringotts Ukrainian Iron Belly Dragon may be on the loose. <laughs> to avoid the Gringotts Dragon, stay in the lobby as you enter into the Gringotts Wizarding Bank to visit one of the Goblin Bankers. Do your business cheerfully and leave. Then you'll be free to be face to face with Hedwick or Lord Baltimore. It's fascinating. Practically speaking, nothing beats the power of magic at home to take care of your household organization and other chores. But there are more surprises ahead, like the Hogwarts Express, as we head over to Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. We go to the dining hall with its magical steins and other movie props, and then off to the official office of Professor Dumbledore alongside his phoenix. Before we leave, I have a bit of fun with Dobby, Harry's befriended elf. This is just pure fun and childish humor. I invite you to have your own. As we say goodbye to the movies, it's now time for our spotlight segment. In our spotlight, we again have 92-year-old Keith Stoneman with us from Portsmouth, England. Keith is a retired business executive, community volunteer, amateur thespian, longtime supporter of the Portsmouth's famous King's Theater, with an interest in British history. Since Portsmouth is a nautical town, Keith is going to share the story of a couple of famous ships in Portsmouth. Keith, welcome back. Thank you for joining us again. I enjoyed our last interview on the King's Theater, and today I was just wondering if you could tell us about the sinking of the Mary Rose back in 1545. Henry VIII was on the balconies of a big fortress tower in South Sea here, called South Sea Castle, to witness his brilliant new great ship sailing out to go and take on the French. Okay. Loaded not only with the ship's crew, but with umpteen marine soldiers, fully armed and so on. Mm. And it got a few hundred yards out when it was reputed, somebody said, go and wave to the king. So all this amount of people rushed to the one side of the ship to wave to the king, which promptly capsized. Oh. And then they discovered, apart from anything else, that somebody had left the gun ports open. So it, when it capsized, there was a whole row of, row of uh, holes in the side of the ship. But the... Uh, the incredible thing is that uh, in 1982, uh, they were dredging uh, to get big, bigger ships into Portsmouth Harbour, and they came across bits of the Mary Rose that were still in good order and is now part of a permanent museum in Portsmouth Duckyard. Oh, great. Uh, and uh, the architects have reconstructed what it would have looked like in its right. day and so on. And they also brought up uh, many, many artifacts, all of which can be seen in the museum. And I've even got a big wall chart in my office of the, uh, of the ship because Pamela, who we mentioned earlier, spent some time when she was uh, with us acting as a tour guide, students and other visitors to the dockyard, uh, and she would show them around the Mary Rose, pointing out all the features to that tower, uh, which she quite enjoyed, except for the French, because the children apparently were so unruly and so disinterested in what was being said. They were only there for the day out. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that Mary Rose. Stop. I fact-checked this story from Keith. Let's take a look at the historian's recount of the event. The Mary Rose was a wind-powered vessel in the pride of the fleet, and in July 1545, it met its demise in the Battle of Solent. All true. But this was not its first voyage. The Mary Rose had been in service for 34 years. It is true that at this battle, King Henry VIII, who originally supervised the ship being built 34 years earlier, was watching the battle from the balcony of South Sea Castle. But the crew of the Mary Rose were busy fighting in the middle of a battle, not waving at the king. 
It is unclear on exactly how the mishap occurred, but the most accurate account is that the Mary Rose made a naval maneuver to offset a French ship's attack, and with the gun ports fully open and a gust of wind, the ship took on too much water, floundered, and sank within minutes. Sadly, this incident killed all but 35 of the 500 people on board. So, now you have it. You can get to choose which story to pass along. For additional factual information on the history of the Mary Rose, you can go to the official Mary Rose website at maryrose.org. It's a great resource for anything you want to know about the Mary Rose. <laughs> Keith, I have to say, you had me believing that myth. I'm not sure I should take a chance on another story at this point, but since we're talking about ships, there's another ship in Portsmouth made famous by its commander, Horatio Nelson who later became Lord Nelson. Could you tell us the story about the ship and about Lord Nelson? Uh, HMS Victory, I think, is known pretty worldwide. And uh, it, it's been a, a center of English heritage uh, ever since. She founded on the time of Nelson, and when Nelson fought the Battle of Trafalgar. And Lord Nelson? Well, he was a young uh, apprentice uh, boy when he joined the Navy under the auspices of his uncle, who was a, a, an admiral of the Navy at the time. So he went in for full naval training, became a midshipman, then he got his own command with a smaller ship and so on. So he grew up through naval ranks and indeed took part in uh, uh, battles against various enemies over time. But again, the world was looking ominous to the Brits uh, in terms of the French and the Spanish, who all seemed to have predatory ideas about uh, coming to England, invading England, whatever. After all, we were only a small island. And so the government of the day wisely decided to build up its navy so that we had some form of defense and indeed, it got to the point where off the uh, uh, port of Cadiz in southern Spain, it was suddenly noted that the French and the Spanish were assembling an armada. And so before they could really take any action, Nelson took a fleet down there. He was a far more accomplished naval tactician. There's all books and diagrams about how he went about destroying the French and the Spanish ships by sailing right through the middle of them when they were least expecting him and uh, indeed won the battle. But okay. unfortunately, just towards the tail end, a sniper, a man with a rifle, on one of the enemy ships took aim and fired at Nelson who was on deck, hit him in the shoulder and gave him a mortal wound. They managed to get him below deck and tried to staunch the blood, but the man sadly died. So he was pickled in a barrel of rum to keep him in good order, as it were, a dead body, but in good order, while they brought him back to England. And uh, he became the hero of the country, hence Nelson's column in the centre of London and all the other artefacts that are around the country. In fact, we have a, a smaller Nelson's column again in Portsmouth, just behind the city. And I have a very, very small recognition of uh, Lord Nelson here behind us in this room. The, the cannon that's yeah. of the ship with a picture of the ship. Keith, thank you. I guess the Portsmouth being the home of the British Navy, it makes sense that there's a lot of nautical references and nautical history here. But in Portsmouth, you know, there's a lot more contribution to the world than just the nautical side. I was surprised to find out how many world famous people were actually either born or lived a significant amount of their uh, life in Portsmouth. I mean, there's literally dozens and dozens that I, uh, that I came across. I can't name them all here, but their contributions range from the most notable writers, including Rudyard Kipling, who wrote The Jungle Book, and of course, many others, H.G. Wells, War of the Worlds and Great Science Fiction, Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes is most notable, 
and industry giants like civil engineer Isbard Kingdom Brunel, who's known as one of the greatest figures of the Industrial Revolution. I guess the one that surprises me the most is that Charles Dickens is connected to Portsmouth. Uh, we mentioned Charles Dickens, who was actually born in Portsmouth. Uh, oh, okay. He became a prolific and well-known author in Victorian times. Uh, his family, in the meantime, had moved to a place called Rochester, which was in the east of the country on the River Thames. Oh, okay. Most of the sort of relics and museum of Charles Dickens are in Rochester rather than Portsmouth. The house where he was born in Portsmouth is still preserved as a, a small museum. Right. Um, some of the uh, books that he wrote, and he was prolific, as I said, uh, that are better known, like A Tale of Two Cities, mm -hmm. Oliver Twist, which later became a, a musical, Christmas Carol, uh, and so on. A complete library of uh, Dickens' works. And again, most of his books are the subject of studies of education uh, and so on. Does it have a significance in terms of English literature? Very much so. Uh, he was a pioneer of English grammar. In fact, some of the uh, vocabulary in England is born out of uh, Dickens' period, as it was out of Shakespeare's period, incidentally. Okay. Thank you for joining us, Keith. And you folks at home, I hope you enjoyed our time in England. We certainly did. Our next episode will take us from Great Britain and England, just across the English Channel, to France, a gorgeous country full of romantic scenery, fine wine, great food, beautiful music, unique architecture, a volatile history, and risque entertainment. In part one, episode six, we'll focus on Paris, the city of romance. And in part two, episode seven, Southern France. Our guest in part one is Joyce Portnoy. Joyce is a Philadelphia resident that lived in Paris for many years, speaks French fluently, and has great memories of her time there to share with us. For now, let's take a quick look at what's ahead of us. Well, we still have a lot to share on England, but unfortunately, it's time to leave this episode. I would have liked to have talked about Stonehenge, uh, more about Bletchley Park, our time in Oxford, as well as our time in Bath. But as we roll the credits, come with me to the English city of Bath, a charming city that's retained many beautiful Roman buildings dating back to the fifth century. Until we see you again, enjoy your travels and stay safe out there. <laughs>